Hello. Ooh, yeah, all right. We're, good. We're ready to go today, aren't we? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to cough a ton just to prepare you. So Ben is also our sound guy. So my name is, Pat. I'm, my name is Ben as well, in case you didn't know that. I'm the Oasis pastor, the college young adult pastor here at Grace Point, And our sound guy is Ben. There's a bunch of Bens running this thing. And so I'm warning you guys now that I'm going to cough. My throat's doing a little something, something. Don't know what it is. My wife's a PA. She couldn't fix it. Blame her. So just going to throw that out right away. We are in our, man, fourth week already of our Learn to Live series. Where we're looking at the life of Elijah. Looking into the Old Testament, into the book of First Kings and Second Kings. And recognizing that Elijah lived in a culture and in a community where they were just anti-God, where there was false idol worship, uh, where people were living for themselves, where selfishness and pride was abound. And that's a culture a lot like ours today. And so we wanted to look at the person of Elijah, this man, this prophet of Elijah, who loved the Lord, uh, someone who, who God used in the midst of that culture to help bring other people either back to God or other people to God. And so we're in our fourth week, and we're going to be starting in 1 Kings 19, and it's almost like a part two from last week. So if you didn't catch last week, it's on the Facebook page, it's up, it's on YouTube, go ahead and watch that. But we're going to pick up a little bit where we left off with Elijah, who was by this bush in this tree. He was depressed because he just saw a mighty work of God. Uh, Brennan spoke a couple of weeks ago on the battle between Elijah and, and the Baal prophets. And there was a battle between, okay, which God is the one true God? Whichever God brings fire onto the altar and lights the altar on fire is the one true God. And so the Baal prophets prayed and, Elijah, and then Elijah prayed and, and Elijah's God, the Lord God, the one true God, creator of all things, the one mighty, perfect God in heaven lit the altar on fire. So Elijah saw this incredible work. And then immediately what we see is a death threat put on his life. And that's what we talked about last week. Is in the midst of having not, I want to say, yeah, false expectations or having unexpected responses to things that you see God doing, unexpected responses to, to situations in life. How do we handle it? How do we trust God in the midst of chaos when things don't go the way we think they should go? And we talked about how Elijah was in a depression and he got to the moment and to the point of having enough. And he prays to God and he says, I had enough, I'm done. Take my life. And we talked about what that looks like in the midst of feeling that, shouting unto God, being honest and vulnerable before him. And then God showed up and provided. And so trusting God in the chaos of life when things don't go as expected and we pick up in the story, and we're going we're gonna to go to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. So if you have a Bible, phone, pull it up. It says this, There he went into a cave and spent the night. Then the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out, stood at the mouth of the cave, and a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? The first week of our series, we looked at how this man, Elijah, was living in the culture that he was living, that he was in with humble obedience. In the second week, Brennan talked about the boldness of Elijah to go and encounter the things of this world, the voices and inputs of, of, of his world and his culture. And in the midst of that, not being afraid and stepping out in boldness for our God. Last week, we talked about what does it look like to trust him when things don't go the way they, we think they should. And this week tonight, we're going to talk about what it looks like, what it maybe feels like even to recognize God's voice. And this is 
to me, a hot button topic, only in the way that I think we put a ton of expectation and assumption on what it means to hear God's voice. I just think we do. There's a, a, a book by, I gotta, I gotta read it, a book by a guy named James Hamilton called Directions that gives some insight about what it looks like listening to God and he tells this story. So who here has seen the first Frozen movie? Yes, raise a hand. You can raise your hand for that, half the people. It's incredible. Me and my family went and saw Frozen 2. It was my first, um, my, daughter's, my daughter's two and a half, her first experience at a movie theater. She did okay. Frozen 2 was incredible. I thought it was great. I, I, I like the Frozen movies. This is the third time I think I've talked about Frozen <laughs> this semester. But in the first movie, <laughs> what we see at the very beginning scene is these men cutting up these blocks of ice from a frozen lake and then carrying these blocks of ice, right? They're dragging them on the lake and they're putting them on um, a cart and they're taking them into town. See, back in the day, they didn't have what we have called refrigerators, which are pretty legit. I love refrigerators, keep my food cold. I have a ton of leftovers from Thanksgiving. I think I put on 15 pounds over the last three days. But we, they didn't have refrigerators. And so what they did is they created and, and, and built these ice shacks. And with these ice shacks, what they do is they bring in, during the wintertime when, when streams and lakes would freeze over, they'd cut these blocks out and bring these blocks of ice, huge blocks of ice into these ice, ice sheds. And what they would do to keep um, the ice cold and, and from melting during the summer, these, the, these, these sheds and these blocks of ice would last into the summer, deep into the summer, is that they'd put a ton of sawdust on them. And that's what they used to preserve their food and to, to keep things from getting rotten. And there's a story of this guy who, who was working in the shed, bringing in icebox, a ton of sawdust, like, like a lot of sawdust. And he's working, and what ended up happening is he lost his watch. And he knew he lost it in the shed, because he had it before he went in, didn't have it when he came out. And so he got all his work buddies, and, and they went into the shed, and they were frantic, running around, trying to find this watch. And they couldn't find it. There was frustration and bitterness and anger, and they just couldn't find it. And in the midst of all the chaos, this young boy, one of the sons of, of, the co- of one of this guy's co-workers, saw all the ruckus, which is a great word, and saw just the chaos of these guys going in and being freaking out. They can't find this watch. It was frustrating. I don't know about you guys. When I lose something, which is all the time, uh, I get upset when I can't find it. It's always in the last place that I put it, but I never remember what that is. Nothing? I thought that was going to be funnier than it was. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the sun, so this, <laughs> that'll get you, apparently I don't have to be funny, I just have to giggle. <laughs> and the sun went into this ice shack, and, and it was maybe a half hour later, he comes out holding the watch. And all these guys and these older men come up to him and like, how did you do it? I don't get it, what did you do? He went in, he closed the door, and he said, I just sat down, I laid down in the sawdust, I closed my eyes, and I didn't move. And what he was able to do is he was hear, be able to hear the ticks and the seconds go by on the clock. And from that, being able to hear the simple, very quiet noise of the tick, he's able to find the watch. I think the question that we ask when it comes to prayer and hearing God's voice is I think we wrestle with, well, does God actually speak? And I don't think that's the right answer. Or I don't think that's the right question. I think the real question is, do we recognize and understand his voice because he's constantly speaking? Or have we become dull of hearing his voice altogether? God is pursuing us every second of every day. He is reaching out, extending his voice to us all the time. The problem isn't, is God speaking? The problem is, do we recognize his voice? There's a whole lot of scripture in 1 Kings 19, and there's a whole lot of things about Elijah that I think I could get into. And for some reason, God this just, over the last week, wanted me just to sit in verse 12 and 13, and wanted us to press into, okay, why did Elijah have this experience he did with this gentle whisper, with hearing God's voice, and what does that mean for us today? Charles Wesley, who is the brother of John Wesley, who is was the founder of the Methodist Church, which is, you heard of United Methodist, it's a denomination in the Christian world, and from the United Methodist Church, the Westland Church, which is our denomination, we are in the Westland denomination, the Westland Church broke out of. So John Wesley 
was essentially the founder of the Wesleyan denomination. He had a brother named Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley wrote a ton of hymns. He was a just master lyricist. He was the Drake of his age. He could just throw them out. Thank you. I gotta go from there. He could just throw them out. He has a lot of hymns. Oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. We have different modern versions of that hymn. He wrote that one. He has a lot of different ones. He, 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 he was a worship leader. He was a pastor. He loved Jesus. And he has this quote that I absolutely love about one, God listening, and then us listening to him. Here's what it says. It says, Lord, listening is one of the hardest things we ever try to do, and few people do it well. But Lord, you listen to us. You call us by name when you answer. Thank you for the privilege we have to be like children and come bounding into your presence. Help us to be quiet and listen while you share your ideas, dreams, and love with us. We want to hear everything you have to tell us. He says, Lord, listening is one of the hardest things we ever try to do, and few people do it well. Again, the question isn't, is God speaking? I think the question we have to answer tonight and what we should wrestle with is, do I recognize God's voice when he is? Do I know what the the voice of God sounds like? Going back to the scripture, going back to verse I'll start in 11 again. We're going to go through just 12. It says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So God comes to Elijah. He says, Okay, I'm about to speak. You're you're still frustrated. You don't know what's going on. I asked you, Elijah, what are you doing here? And you said, I've been zealous for you. I've followed you. The, the, The plan that I put in place worked. You showed your power. And the people of God didn't do anything. They didn't repent and turn back to you. They didn't overthrow King Ahab and Jezebel. They stayed where they were. And I'm frustrated. He's angry. He's lost. And so God recognizes and says, okay, stand on the mountain, the presence of the Lord. The Lord's about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. The Lord is not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out, and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here? Elijah, in his ministry and in the few stories that we said, had recognized the power of God on display. He had seen God move and work and speak through fire as he brought it down from heaven onto the altar. Elijah knows and recognizes the power of God and knows when he's in it. And so Elijah's standing on the mountain and he's, he's potentially in this cave. And as he's sitting there, an earthquake happens and shakes, which was from God, but God, God was not found in him. And then the, the wind came. And the scripture tells us now God was not in the wind. And then fire came. How Elijah just previously experienced God. The fire came down, but it says God was not in the fire. And then it was a gentle whisper, and all of a sudden we see Elijah get up. Puts his cloak over his face, preparing to come face to face with the Lord because God was in the gentle whisper. And there are a lot of different things and a lot of different reasons. A lot of different commentaries, a lot of different pastors and people who are way smarter than me who try to explain, okay, what does it mean that God was in this gentle whisper? Why was he not in the fire and the wind and the earthquake, but in this gentle whisper? Some versions say the still, small voice of God. And what I want to do is give us two points, two things that I see as I read this when it comes to try to listen to God and hearing his voice. First, when it comes to listening to God, don't put him in a box. See, what I think as I read this is Elijah had already, had already experienced hearing from the Lord. Elijah knew the voice of God. That's why Elijah was able to discern, okay, God's not in the fire or in the earthquake or in the wind. I think Elijah had an expectation to experience and hear from God, to see him move and work in a way that he had already seen him move and work. And then all of a sudden, this gentle whisper, this still small voice comes and he gets up. I think we do this, whether based off of how we grew up 
based off of experience, which is not bad, uh, based off of our own church's tradition and, and even the, the, the church, the history of the church and their tradition on, on how we've seen God speak and God move and how we've recognized and how people in our past um, and, and, and pastors in our past and even apostles and disciples as we read scripture, we saw how they heard the voice of God. And what we tend to do is wanting to hear God's voice and wanting to, to hear him speak to us as if we put him in a box and, and, and we have this assumption that he only speaks in certain ways. I think sometimes we expect an earthquake or wind or fire when what God is doing in the moment is speaking in a gentle whisper in a still small voice. I know I had this assumption. And this is really, this is a tough one for me because I know I still put God in a box when it comes to hearing from him, when it comes to listening to him. So what I want to do is something that I'm not used to and that I'm, I'm not going to say uncomfortable with, but it's just, it's something I'm not used to. Is I'm going to go through different methods of revelation from God, different ways that God speaks to us to try to help us just get a broader view of what it looks like when God speaks. So number one, First method of revelation is God speaks to us with impressions or internal thoughts. And there are scripture everywhere in the Bible. This is that simple idea of what we would call a gut feeling. Now, sometimes I get gut feelings. I don't know about you guys, but I get gut feelings, and sometimes it's just my gut because I ate horribly. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes, but sometimes there's something that happens just in my soul in the inner part of me that is pushing me and moving me and, and, and saying something to me. I was on a, um, uh, it was called a summer project with Campus Crusade for Christ, which is crew. And I went to Miami for 12 weeks uh, in the summer of 08, and it was amazing. <laughs> and I, we, I got assigned the campus of Florida International University, and I was on a project with 30 other students, and it was an incredible experience, and, and what we do is we go to campus three days out of the week, and we go and try to, to, to share the gospel and evangelize and, and pray for people. And the first day, and I think in moments where just my immaturity and being naive, is I had made a plan on the way there that I had to talk to so many people. That it wasn't about, okay, God, how are you going to move and lead in this moment? It's okay, I'm going to check a box and make sure that I talk to this amount of people. And then once I talk to that amount of people, I'm done for the day and I can wait for everyone else to get done. And I did that the first day and I had some horribly awkward conversations. I got cussed at once, which was super fun. Getting yelled at, people just saying no. I had a couple conversations that weren't terrible. But at the end of it, and, and it's not bad to want to go talk to people, want to pray for people, want to go share the gospel. But what I knew for me in that moment in that day was that I did, not, I did not allow myself to stop and rest and ask God to lead me. And so I'm frustrated and angry, and then the very next day, we're going out again, and we're driving in our van, and, and I'm talking to one of the staff members of crew, and he's talking to me. He's like, well, what if we just rest, sit, go sit in their union, and just pray, and ask God just to lead us to someone? So we sit there, and we pray, and I'm ADHD and I'm super anxious and excited and I want to go and I just I also think I'm still in this mindset of checking the box and going to talk to people I've got to talk to all the people they need Jesus and so he says Ben you need to calm down or you're going to have a heart attack and so we calm down we stop and we pray and all of a sudden we're praying and my, my soul calms down a little bit and I just get this impression in my soul there's this one guy sitting to the next table of us and I just I felt it it was, it was legitimately these are these Impressions or internal thoughts, is their feelings where God was doing something and the Spirit was doing something in the moment saying, you need to go talk to this person. And so I told Ross, who, who was my leader, and I said, we're supposed to, I feel like we're supposed to go talk to this guy right now. And so we go over and he's eating lunch and we talk to him. And we just start asking him about his life. And he starts staring, sharing his story with us. He's, he's from Haiti and he came over to get an education and he wanted to go back home to be able to help his family. And then we got to the point of, of, of religion and faith and what that looked like for him and what that meant for him. But he said the Sunday before, two days before, he went to a church for the very first time, a Christian church. And he had this experience that he didn't understand and didn't fully know. 
And what he knew in that moment, he said on that Sunday, he said, I know that I need to just ask more questions about this Jesus. And what God ended up doing is he led me and Ross to this guy two days later to share the gospel with him. He ended up giving his life to Jesus. There are some moments and times where we just have impressions in our gut. And are we bold enough just to move forward? To say yes. And a lot of times in the midst of those impressions or those thoughts, it requires just resting with the Lord. It requires especially in the, in the quietness of our day, in, in whether it's at night or in home or whatever, it's like, okay, it's, it's being able to pray and ask, okay, is this from me or is this from you, God? That's not bad to ask those questions. It's not bad to wonder, okay, is this just something that I'm feeling that I want, really want to do, God, or is this you leading me to doing this? And this looks different for everyone on how it comes about. For me, it's, it's based off feeling, and it's just something that I, I just, this is what I feel like I'm supposed to do. Another way that God just reveals himself is through visions. Uh, these basically are snapshots or still images that we kind of see in our mind's eye. I knew a gal, <clears throat> and know a gal still now, I guess, who is an incredible worship leader uh, back at the church that I came from up at Cornerstone. And she would legit get these visions from God. And she got a vision uh, at, at one point about our church and our senior pastor at the time. And what was happening Behind the scenes, uh, people didn't really fully know or recognize is our senior pastor at that moment was our interim, meaning he was just there for a season until we found someone that was going to take over. And what was happening is that I think from a higher level, people were really wondering if this is a guy who should be in this position. He was getting emails and, and, and things from, from people just making sure that he's doing the things he's supposed to do. Uh, they're checking in, okay, how are numbers going? How are things growing? What does this look like? How are you doing? And just like overly checking in. And, and this gal got this vision. She said, okay, I got this weird vision, Ben. I need to tell you because if I don't tell someone, I feel like I'm being disobedient. She says, I got this vision of, of our pastor standing in a field and an army coming at him. And as his army is coming at him, he feels alone and afraid, and he doesn't know what to do. And all the while she's saying this, I know what's happening behind the scenes with our senior pastor. I know what's happening with his life, how he's being attacked in different ways, how he's stressed out over basically his job, whether he's going to lose it or not, or get taken away, or be moved, or whatever. And for me, it was just this confirmation and this recognition that, okay, I just assumed, yes, I had this idea and knowledge that, okay, God speaks through visions, but I never experienced it. And for me in that moment, it was nice just to know, okay, God does speak like this. It sometimes is just an image or a picture. We, I, I like to go, I'm a weirdo, but I like to go and I like to just go to the mall or to Hy-Vee or Walmart and I'll pray and I'll ask, okay, God, who's one person that you want me to talk to today? And I'll say, give me an image or give me a vision. And sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. I'll say, give me a word. There was one moment and one time where he gave me a picture of a gal in a red sweatshirt. This, this is red sweatshirt came to my mind. And so I was with, with one of my friends and we were going out and doing this. One of the guys I was discipling, we were going out. I was like, I got a red sweatshirt. I think we're just supposed to walk around until we see a red sweatshirt and see what happens. And so we're going and we're walking around and, and all of a sudden I see this gal with this red sweatshirt and I start freaking out. It's like, this is, this is her. Like this person's gonna give their life to Jesus. And I'm like being weird about it too. Like I'm like tapping this guy on the shoulder like, hey, God, this, is, this is the one we're going to go. Like this predatorial, like psycho <laughs> thing. And I was like, but this is it. And so we go up to her and, and, and we just say, hey, we're just walking around really creepy, two guys walking around praying for people. Do you have anything you need prayer for? And she goes, no. I go, are you sure? <laughs> Do you, no. It's like, okay. And I'm just, because I wear my emotions on my sleeve, I'm not happy about it. So we walk away, and we're just going, and I'm just walking around. I was like, this is so dumb. I'm so mad about this right now. And we go, and we walk, and this guy, like, we, we had this time limit of an hour for some reason, and we're walking around, and <laughs> no joke, this gal comes and finds us. And she says, okay, this was really weird. I was really scared when you get to, I had two random guys come up and ask me if I needed prayer for something. She felt unsafe, but she says, I do actually have something I need prayer Her sister had just found out she had cancer, and she wanted us to pray for her sister. And it's just because I stopped, we rested, and we said, God, we know that there's people in here who need you. We want to go pray for people. Is there 
a way that you, something you can show us. And he just did. And sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes I don't get a vision. Sometimes I just go and pray throughout the building and see what happens. Another way that God speaks to us and to people is through dreams. The difference between dreams and visions, very simple. Uh, dreams are when you sleep. Visions are when you're awake. That's it. Like in the Old Testament, you'll read scriptures in Daniel and Job, and it says, instead of saying, and he had a dream, it says, and he had a vision of the night, which I think is an awesome phrase. I start asking my son, hey, Wesley, did you have any visions of the night last night? He thinks I'm psycho because he's four and doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Number four, sometimes God speaks to people through an audible voice. We see this in, in Jesus' baptism, uh, where he gets baptized, and all of a sudden the heavens opened up and the voice of God came and shout out, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Now, for me, I have never like audibly heard the voice of God. Hello, Ben. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't have done it. It was a terrible idea. <laughs> I don't know if you know, I started smiling, like cheesing out before I got it because I knew he was going to do it. I thought like we just need some comic relief. Before that. Thanks, Brennan. I just threw him under the bus. <laughs> I'm so dumb. Um, <laughs> I love it. But some people get this audible voice. I've never had that experience, and that's not bad. It's not bad to have not had that experience, but that's how God speaks sometimes. The whole goal here is like, let's not put God in a box and how he speaks to us. The last one, or not the last, the next one I'm going to mention is scripture. Like, it's legit. God speaks to us through scripture. We use the scriptures to test the, the feelings that we get, those gut feelings that we get, the visions and the dreams that we get, the audible voices that, that, that we hear either audibly or in our head, these internal thoughts. We use the scriptures to test those things. Okay, does this line up? Does this make sense with who God is and who God says I am? Also, just reading devotionally as, as you read your scripture, and I encourage you to do this daily, is as you read a scripture, all of a sudden you get this feeling of something, whether it's joy or happiness, or like, oh, something jumps out of the page. I believe that's God speaking to you as you read his word. He's doing something in that moment. He wants, he wants you to recognize that, hey, this is jumping out for a reason. Press into this. Meditate on this. Read this again. Read this again. And it's in the moment where we can say, okay, God, what are you trying to say to me as I read this scripture? And in the midst of that, okay, what do you want me to do about it? And the last one I'm going to talk about is this God speaks to other people. Sometimes the Lord just relays his messages through other people. Uh, in Luke 2, there's a story <laughs> of Jesus. And he was just, just was born. There's a story of, an, of a man named Simeon. And it says Simeon was full of the Holy Spirit. Simeon knew the Lord. And I just, I gotta go to it. I think it's just too cool. And starting in verse 25, it says, there's a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Jump down to verse 33. It says, the child, so Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the synagogue to get him circumcised because that was just the Jewish ritual of the day and he, he was getting circumcised. And when he got to the temple, uh, it says this, Simeon saw him, went to him, uh, took, him in his, took him from his parents and said in verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may, you may now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation. In verse 33, it says, The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel to be a sign that will be spoken against. And it's just the reality that God was using Simeon to tell Mary, I think a confirmation of this is the Messiah. When the angel came to you and said, you, being a virgin, are going to have a kid, and that kid is going to be the son of God and is the son of God. This is confirmation for Mary in the moment that God just speaks to other people. Simeon was speaking to Mary, giving confirmation. What God told you was true and right. God, God uses other people to speak to us. The whole point of the last however many minutes What's well, to get us into this point, that get us to the reality that we need to not put God in the box when it comes to hearing from him. Don't assume that he needs to speak to you in a certain way. Be open to the different ways that God reveals himself to us, that God speaks. Be open and rest and pray, asking for God, for God to speak to you in new and different ways. And in the process, just trust him. Don't put God in a box. 
In order to recapture this normal capacity for relating to God, we as his people need to learn his methods of communication, don't put him in a box, and grow in our sensitivity, sensitivity to his voice. Second point, I'm gonna have Jana come up and the team come up. Second point is this, the key to hearing God's voice is to know what God's voice sounds like. The key to hearing God's voice is to know what God's voice sounds like. And here, here's why this is important. We look at Elijah. The earthquake came, God wasn't in it. The wind came, God wasn't in it. The fire came, God wasn't in it. And all of a sudden, a gentle whisper, and Elijah shot up. Elijah, Elijah recognized the voice of God. He knew in that moment that God was trying to speak. And how he did that is he had purposeful, intentional moments daily with the Father, with the Lord, where he was able to hear from him, where he was able to get these impressions, where he was able to hear him speak. I think so much in our life, we want to get, into the, get to these moments where chaos is happening, where we get in times of trial and struggle and frustration, and we go to God and we pray and we expect to hear something from him in some way. God, give us a sign. God, speak to me through your word. God, speak to me through other people. God, speak to me in an impression or an internal thought. But what ends up, what ends up happening is we can't recognize the voice of God in those moments because what we're doing is we're trying to hear the voice of God in the craziness of our life. We're trying to hear the voice of God as chaos is happening. And the reality is, is if you want to know what he sounds like during the craziness and the chaos, we didn't know what his voice sounds like in the stillness of our night. And here's what this means. Are we getting alone with him? Are we going into the shed, shutting the door and resting and sitting and being silent? God's voice started becoming more clear to me. I was able to recognize the impressions that God would give to me because I started meeting with him daily. As I started to meet with him daily, as I started to worship him through music and through prayers, I started to read his word daily. I started to see how he moved and how he worked. I saw his heart for people and his desire for those to want to come to know him. His desire for those to know that he loves them. His desire for those who are stressful and anxious for that burden to be lifted. For those who are chained up, for those shackles to be broken. His desire for the blind to have sight. The slave to be freed. It wasn't in the specifics of what I needed to do with my life or, or who I needed to marry or, 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 or what I needed to even specifically do today or this morning. It was when I understood the full purpose of why we're here, the reality that there are so many people who need Jesus. And God started giving me a heart for those people that as I met with him daily, I was able to recognize his voice. In the quietness of my home, In the stillness of my night, I was able to recognize his voice. And as I'd go out, and as I would just live life, I would recognize those same impressions. It's the moment I had a couple weeks ago going to give plasma and having a gal stick a needle in my arm, which sometimes just is terrible. And she's doing it, I'm asking her about her life and how long has she been working there? And all of a sudden she spills her story to me, and I'm able to recognize in those moments of her just sharing her life, God, this is someone who is lost and broken and who needs you, who doesn't know what to do with their future, who is confused, what I feel like is confused about what this life has to offer. And I felt that, and I asked, God, how do you want me to minister and help and love and serve this person now? And I just listened. And when she was done with the story she was sharing, what I felt impressed on my heart and my soul was not to share the gospel in Jesus. It was in that moment to say, I hope you know that I have a God who loves you and I'll be praying for clarity in this situation. And I felt more than comfortable, more than comfortable leaving it there because the God I love and serve, I know is gonna bring people into her life that love him is gonna bring people into her life that are gonna share the good news because that's our God. Now that doesn't give me an excuse not to have moments where I need to share the gospel and need to tell people about Jesus. 
But as I met with him daily, I was able to recognize a voice and recognize what he's asking me to do in those moments. Don't put God in a box. Don't assume he speaks one way or a certain way or certain ways. And the key to knowing his voice is being able to recognize it. Get with him. Close the door. Meditate, chew, and read the scriptures. See how he works, how he loves his character and his heart. Jane is gonna sing a song called I'm Listening. And what I want for this to be is a song and a moment for us to just be still and allow the chorus of this song to be the prayer of our heart. So as she's playing, just allow the words just to flow over you, to come into your mind, to come into your heart, to come into your soul. Speak, confusion fades. Just a word, and suddenly I'm not afraid. Cause when you speak, and freedom reigns, there is hope in every single. feeling and impression and thought 
even now tonight, I believe that God has been speaking to us. And so what I wanna do for the next couple minutes, there's gonna be some questions on the screen. And these are questions that I use when I have that impression or that thought. When I hear someone else speak and I feel like God's speaking through them, when I, when I read the word or if I have a vision or a dream, you see, in all those things, it doesn't automatically mean it's God. And so I feel like there's things that we have to do to be able to help ourselves know, okay, what, how can I get clarity on it? Is this God? Is this me? Is this the enemy trying to distract, to steal, kill, and destroy? So there's going to be questions. You can go and throw them up. And what I want you to do is I want you to take the next couple minutes is read through these questions. Is there something that God has just impressed on your heart? Right, it could be anything from a confirmation of who he is. A confirmation of who you are could be something you know you've been struggling with for a while that you just need to let go. It could be super broad in affirming his love for you, his grace that he's shown you through his son Jesus. It could be something incredibly specific. In the midst of what happened tonight through the songs, scripture, speaking, what do you feel like God's been saying to you? As you think about your week with family <laughs> this last holiday, what happened? Were there events or moments? Were there feelings that you had that you knew something was different about it, that you should process or think through or figure out? In that moment, were you able to ask, or even now are you able to ask, okay, God, what was that about? What are you trying to say? And how we know as God is this. You look at those things in these moments, say, okay, is what I received in line with what his word says? And how I know that is I gotta go to his word or with his character. Is it peaceable? Is it something that brings you peace? Colossians 3 tells us to live at peace as much as is possible for you. Does it point you to Jesus and to Christ-like Holy Spirit-filled life? Is it confirmed by others who are mature in the Christian life? And this is so important because we are not asked to be alone and to live a life by ourselves, to live this faith, this relationship with God by ourselves. We're asked to be, we're invited into each other's lives to be able to ask these questions. Then lastly, does it encourage, edify, and strengthen and or convict you or does it dishearten you, diminish, or condemn you? And here's the difference. The first words are from the Father. His goal is to encourage you and strengthen you. Conviction happens when there's sin and things in our life that we know we need to get rid of, and God just give us, gives us this conviction that we need to let go of it. Condemnation and shame comes from the enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you, who will point something at you or about you in your life that you've already let go of. Or he'll, he'll, he'll plant a lie into your head that you aren't loved or that God's not for you. We need to know how to discern these things. And these are questions I used to be able to do that. So take the next minute next to you, look through these questions, write them down. Is there something that's happening in your life, in your heart? Test them against these things. And then we're gonna end tonight in worship to declaring the promises of God and expressing our faith in Him.